There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the One Within All to Innerverse. I'm your host, Chance, and I hope everyone out there is thriving in spite of the survival scare and ready for another dose of creative critical thinking that can help us shake off the chains of cultural conditioning, intellectual indoctrination, and woeful worldviews, because this episode is all about decolonizing your imagination. Humanity at large is long overdue for a system reboot of our spiritual sight so that we can learn to diagnose our personal situations through the lens of synchro mystical perception. In the history of this podcast, we've spent a lot of time exploring how the as above, so below alchemical blueprint can be applied to our lives. And hopefully, in our personal journeys, there have been benefits to seeing our inner and outer worlds as metaphorical mirror images. Of course, it's also true that anytime a brighter light shines on something, a darker shadow lies beneath it. And by increasing our awareness of our dream reality, we start to see more and more of the sore spots, forgotten messes, and problematic patterns lying just below the surface of our collective and individual consciousness. Some of these issues we're uncovering are so prevalent in the population that with and without intentional planning, there are many events and developments where evil, greed, and bad intentions are able to unfold in dark, synchronistic concert on a large scale. It seems like these days just about everybody buys into at least a few conspiracy theories, but not many people are yet able to accept the ultimate red pill out of the matrix, which is the realization that our entire society, history, and culture is founded on the inversion of natural law, the hijacking of human energy, and the embargo on truth. It may be a bitter medicine to take, but if one does their due diligence in becoming symbolically literate, Researching the power structures of the world reveals a lockstep global orchestra of governments, religions, mass media, and education systems that are designed to disconnect the individual from their innermost source and create generation after generation of obedient and docile workers who never once dream of anything other than their day job and the entertainments that are provided to them. To help us get a better handle on the neural pathways that have been implanted in humanity and how they connect to the macrocosmic etheric pathways in our shared external reality, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Michael Wan, a mage of all trades and anomaly magnifier who spent the better part of the last 20 years cracking the codes to the simulation and waking people up from the dream of separation. In his early career, Michael played the role of the average Joe, working in the telecom industry for companies that pioneered the commercial usage of cloud computing and proto 5G technology. But at some point along the way, not long after the events of 9-11, Michael ditched the corporate life and began to research a plethora of occult topics, including conspiracy, hidden history, magic, hypnosis, sacred geometry, synchro mysticism, spycraft, and just about everything else that's esoteric. He's also developed innovative and atypical artistic skills that have served him well in his current role as a professional astrologer. In recent years, Michael has been making the rounds through various esoteric podcasts and is well known for his own YouTube channel where he uncovers the synchromistic connections between cultural phenomenon and occultural influences, with some of his most notable work being on the mystery of the Susquehanna River, an analysis that reveals the incredibly intricate 400 plus year and counting magical working that state-sponsored secret societies have been layering throughout our society in order to bring about a totalitarian interpretation of the Age of Aquarius. In his Susquehanna series, Michael reveals and links the emergences of globalism, the electrical age, and the computer industry as all part of a bigger picture. And that's just the tippy top of the iceberg. It's going to be a tough time for me steering this conversation since there are about a thousand things I'd like to talk to Michael about, but that's a good problem to have. Before we get started, make sure and check the show notes for Michael's website, susquehannaalchemy.com, and his YouTube channel of the same name, where you can find hours of in-depth synchro mystic research into many occult topics, including an amazing research series about the 100-year transition from the first computer to the singularity, and some very interesting stuff on the current coronavirus craziness, just to name a bit of it. You can also find a link in the show notes for Interverse Plus on Patreon, where you can become a supporting member of this show and unlock the exclusive second hour of the episode and dig into the huge archive of double-length podcasts. 
And a big thank you to all of our members out there that helped me keep this thing growing. It's been great to see all the new people signing up and getting into the plus content this month. Definitely makes me happy. But now we can finally begin this wild ride through the mystery with the Susquehanna Sage of the Electric Age, conqueror of computer-created cons, and astronumerological alchemist, Michael Wan. Thanks for being here, dude, and welcome to Interverse. Thank you for having me. That was a hell of an introduction on, on many levels. First, like, I mean, the decolonization of the imagination. I wrote that down. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that one. I like that. But you, you really encapsulated generally what I think of as a very like, it's not complex, but it's like we're describing a big interconnected tale and you did a beautiful job doing that. So thank you. you you've obviously put a lot of time into my work and I can see where you've at least mirrored it back exactly how I've intended to put it out there. So I appreciate that greatly. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I think that the timing of it right now is incredibly significant in the collective timeline. You know, we've never seen anything on, as you said, this lockstep, this lockstep movement where like every authoritative structure is, is doing the same thing. Like, you know, every country saying the same thing and like, it's everything which people have been talking about for a very long time seems to be coming to a head. And so now is, now's, now's the time. This is it. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. And I want to talk about this lockstep phenomenon because it's one of the things that you posted on your Instagram about this world on fire phrase that you caught being used everywhere. And it's something that you can look into for yourself pretty easily that the media is at least works in lockstep and has for a long time. And what I mean by that is you can actually find news reports or, you know, local news channels, recordings that they upload to YouTube from the same day and go from one city to the next. And they usually don't even change the phrasing of what they're talking about. Some of them do, but they're all reporting the same types of stories nationally. And now we see the real ramifications of that with the lockdown situation. We're in lockstep lockdown. <laughs> the thing is, which, which is interesting is the, the move is so evident. It's like, you know, you're either completely not going to ever see it. Or if, or if you've ever slightly been on the fence, you're like, okay, okay. Now it's, it's too much. Like, you know, once the initial, like you've, sh you've shaken off the, the, the punch, particularly like I'm saying this from a very mainstream mind, mainstream to like being willing to start to question things like, you know, that that's the majority of, of, of the population from my perch for where I'm sitting, I see two things, you know, I see one, which is a dream and we could get into what I mean by dream in a moment. And it's being coincided with something which is greater, a deeper reality. So it's kind of like hijacking it, but it's hijacking something which is a greater truth. Like, you know, there really is something strange seemingly that is occurring or at least the stories that it is so, it is so strongly on lockdown. That's amazing. And what I'm thinking about is like, you know, just like all of like the strange stuff, which is happening in outer space. Like we, we mentioned this, we mentioned this before, before we started recording was you have to hold like during this time, if you're trying to, if you're trying to navigate what is being put out there, you have to hold on to the truth that there is a blind spot and we don't know how deep the dream goes. So there's a possibility when I'm making reference to like what's being seen on the Soho satellites that there's no freaking thing as a Soho satellite. Like, you know, this is part of the story. But that being said, the Soho satellites, they they monitor the sun for like sun activity. Just like two days ago, there was this like really strange coronal mass ejection. Like a double one happened simultaneously on the opposite ends of the sun, which I you know, I follow the sun a little bit, like, so I know that the double isn't that common, particularly like this, but I don't know how often it happens, but that happened. And we're seeing like a lot of interesting comet stories come up just the other day, you know, first it was Atlas and then it was, and then it was Swan. So you got like that's going on. And then we have like, actually what's happening is 
this real movement in the heavens of like Jupiter and Saturn. They're in the same place and they both moved into Aquarius at the same time. And these are like big energies. And, you know, Pluto's about to do the same thing. Like this doesn't happen all that that frequently. So we're, we're seeing like on this greater narrative, and I'm not saying that's the greatest narrative. I'm just saying that's like a bigger narrative than, than, than what we're thinking about in terms of like news or even earth, that there are all of these things that are happening. And then the news stories and what we're experiencing is tied to it. But the stuff which we're seeing on the news, and this is what, where, where I, I, I talk about the dream and I want to go into the movie inception, but but the dream is, and I can only speak for myself, and this is what we really need to become aware of right now is what do we experience in our actual reality and what do we know which comes from a computer box? You know, whether your computer box is hanging on your wall or whether it's your laptop or your phone, it's like how much is something which is just information which is coming from this, this, this device where there's nothing in your, 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 no one's knocked on your door and said, you can't come out. And this is, you know, I got a shotgun and I'm the, I'm the police. Maybe that's happened to some people, but for the most part is there's this, there's, there's just a message which is being put out there, which is just purely an abstract. I'm not saying it's not happening. I'm just saying like, this is what, how it, 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 it integrates into like, or it bleeds through into like material reality. And everyone seems to have that. And then everyone accepts that as like as truth. And this is part of the dream. I'm not, I'm not saying there's not a, there's not a virus. I'm not saying that what there's, there's, there's not like, I'm not even getting into like the, the material element because there's a material truth to this, but this is beginning is just a dream. It's beginning is just an idea, an abstract which is then internalized and then we're seeing ex it expressed. Like that's literally what we're seeing happen in, in a very, very well orchestrated way in front of us. And we can see its degree of effectiveness by, you know, what people are doing. And this is like, you know, how we're, we're getting our bearings as to what's happening. Yeah, man. And I think maybe a good place to go from here to really flesh out this concept is the, an idea that I've um, adopted from you since I first heard you talking about it. And I've even explained it in brief on the show once or twice, but this idea of neural pathways in the brain and etheric pathways in the external reality, you have uh, to quote you, you say, just as hypnosis can establish neural pathways in the brain, what we call magic can establish etheric pathways in the world. And just as some hypnotists are more effective than others, so is true with magicians establishing etheric pathways. So uh, the, the gist of this, I'd love for you to help us understand it and how the as above, so below alchemical formula really plays out in the way belief systems and perception, whether it's perception of something true or not, actually shapes the direction that the world develops in. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a really, really important, important topic to get into. And I'm glad you brought it up and you, you nailed it in the, in, when you said that the as above, so below principle. So if, if you can apply that in a very, very literal sense, you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to navigate this environment we're in. And so it's, I don't claim by any stretch of the imagination to understand like what base reality is. I don't know if this is a simulation. I don't know if I'm a simulation. I don't know what any of this stuff is. There are a lot of cool ideas and there's a lot of stuff I resonate with, but I know like, you know, I'm just voting for what like feels the best to me, but I, I'm, I'm but I'm cool with that. Like, because at least I know I'm, I'm doing that consciously. And so there's, there's, I don't know what, what, what all this is, but what I do know is kind of what, how this thing works. <laughs> and so it's like, at the very least, we can be like, well, we're here. You know, it's like, you know, I don't know exactly where here is and I don't know what it is, but I know I'm here and I know that there's kind of like what I want to do and not want to do and what I enjoy and all this sort of stuff. And so that being said, we're at a place right now that this ability to become very, very good at understanding at least the setup of how experience, you know, I like to call it experience rather than reality, how it works. And so what we're able to do is, 
it's as you said, the, the as above, so below. And that's like very, very literal. And we want to think about the microcosm. We want to think about everything that we can kind of look down on. And we're, we're above, we can see it. And when you are looking down on something, you know, you have a much, much better perspective. And so the best thing which we can kind of look down on is ourselves. And, you know, and when you're beginning to have a sense of awareness of how you operate, you know, know thyself. And that's, that's a, a never ending process. But, you know, you begin to recognize, you know, this is, this is how I work. And, and I often think I'm doing something for this reason, but then I realize I did for this other reason, all this sort of stuff. So it's like you begin to, as you begin to have awareness and you begin to, to understand what it means to be a human being and to have like, you know, these sort of tools, which we have a mind, a brain and, you know, analytical abilities and abilities to, to, to disconnect and, and see from a higher perspective. So we can look inside of ourselves with, with a greater degree of ease as we begin to have awareness. And so what we're told is a model. And so this is like, this is half abstract, but it's, it seems to be very real because we always got to be like, you know, willing to question any belief and realize the probability. But so we have these things called neural pathways. This is what our neuroscientists tell us. And neural pathways are really, really exciting, or I think they're exciting, because it bridges the gap between this, this intangible thing of behavior, you know, or feelings and actions. You know, what, what exactly is it? I can't put it in a box, but I can describe it and I can have it. And then with physical anatomy, like, you know, I could actually go inside the physical body and we can see these like well-entrained, at least for the strong ones, these neural pathways. And what these neural pathways are very, very entrained connections of, of neurons. Um, and I guess that would be all throughout the, the, the nervous system of where the, the electricity, the energy flows, the bioelectricity within the, bo the body. And they are a particular, a particular neural pathway, like as it's used more and more and more, it corresponds directly with a specific type of thought and a specific type of, of behavior. So now you're like, well, I can't actually see a neural pathway in my head. Like I, I can't see it. I don't even know they exist. They tell me they exist. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to accept that it's true. I'm like, okay, but it's at least a model. So I'm imagining this inside myself and then you begin to recognize you have these certain behaviors, particularly unconscious behaviors. When you realize that you're doing things and you don't even realize you're doing them or you think you're doing something else. And I know for me, one of the, like the, you first become aware of this as an idea and then you begin to, to actually see it in action. And for me, the first time I really saw it was I used to work like in a corporate marketing job and I would travel around to the different sales offices from corporate and I would give presentations and stuff and I'd rehearse. I'd rehearse beforehand. I'd rehearse by looking in the mirror. And I began to notice that whenever I would say something which I did not exactly like understand or I didn't exactly believe, like there was something like not quite like I was in harmony with, I would touch my face. I would see this like in front of the mirror and then I began realizing that there was that connection. And I'm like, but wait a minute, I got an itch there. Like, I'm not just touching my face. And what happens is when you can begin to see, like you catch yourself like in action, that you're like, there's a whole set of systems which, are, which is going on within me, which, which I'm not even aware of. And so this is where neural pathways come in is like, you know, you're beginning to see this behavior set which is unconscious, but it seems to be tied into, into like your, your anatomy. So that's the neural pathway, kind of the, the relationship with, with behavior. So then the question becomes like, you know, how do they, how do they come in? How are they formed? And they're formed like naturally, like we seem to be designed, you know, the human being, the brain, the way the brain works is, is like we have experience and then we respond to it and we have these neural pathways. And so part of it is just like a natural, how we, you know, if you want to get into astrology, we could say astrology is going to explain how you're going to naturally respond to a particular um, input of, that, of, of an experience of energy because everyone's going to do it differently. And, and we could tie that in like maybe more physiologically into, into the brain. So it's like you have an experience and then like, you know, you, you come up with your coping mechanism and this is kind of how, how these neural pathways 
are established. And for most people, and then there are other ways, like there are more tangential ways, like, you know, that's what all of like, when you hear about this, like SRA, the satanic ritual abuse, MK ultra, all this stuff is really, really, really militarized, weaponized version of this natural way of which our brain works. Like, you know, through like intense emotion, through repetition, through all these different things, you create these neural pathways hypnotists can do it also. Like there are all of these different ways of getting into the neural pathways, creating new ones. And then the one other thing though, I didn't say this about the neural pathways, and this is really important because we're going to get to the etheric pathways, but I really wanted to spell out the neural pathways. So the other thing is the neural pathways, they work through, through symbolism. And so you have a neural pathway and which corresponds to a behavior and how it works is there is something that occurs in reality which is similar in symbolic nature to where this underlying or the original neural pathway was, was laid. And if there's something similar to it, then you can activate these neural pathways, meaning that the behavior will naturally show itself. You know, maybe as something happened to me as a child, like that's why I have that itch there and that's where that neural pathway came when, when like I felt uncomfortable saying something I knew wasn't true, you know, maybe that's where it came for me. But from a more acute uh, version is like you would tie in very, very specific behaviors to specific, like you could do symbols, hand symbols. That's all the MK ultra and the hypnosis is the anchoring. And the reason why anchoring works is because it's about connection, things that on the neural pathway level, it works by symbolism. It's interesting. I'll just interject. I am realizing about myself that I have a tendency when I'm uncomfortable or anxious to touch the back of my neck, right where the neck and the head meet. And I'll just catch myself when I'm kind of antsy, just like rubbing this spot and touching this spot unconsciously. I, have, I do it all the time. It's exactly what you're talking about. And, and that's part of this like like this awakening process is on every level. Like that is immensely, immensely significant. Like the fact that you made that connection and every single person has these different sort of things that they begin to, to which they do unconsciously. Like that's connected to some sort of neural pathway, which is probably connected to some sort of experience. And like the more, and then, you know, why there, you know, if you want to get into like energy centers, you want to get into the third eye, you want to get into the throat, or you want to get into like, I was hitting my neck. I don't know. But like, as you begin to go deeper and, and, and analyze, like this is, this happens on every level. Like this is the awareness, like you're opening all, you're going deep into this, this unconscious or this hidden or this occultic or this esoteric level and all esoteric and all occultic, all subconscious, like they, they're more alike than less alike. Like as soon as you begin to get into that occulted world with it, and you have a familiarity as above, so below, you're able to do it in many, many, many different planes. So th this is the other thing. So here's another very clear, acute example, maybe like not as, as fantastic as, you know, the MK Ultra, but any PTSD, by definition, PTSD says like there was a, a timing of trauma, which was, and what trauma is, is when there is a influx of energy, emotion, it could be physical, it could be mental, it could be sound, it could be sight, anything which floods our, our, our receptors, you know, our physical receptors, our sight, our hearing, our emotion. And if it's too much to be processed at the time, you know, that is the definition of trauma. It was greater than your threshold for what you can process. And so this gets stored, it gets stored in cells, it gets stored in memory, it gets stored in all this different stuff. Like this is and so that's also like the, the neural pathway. And so let's say that we often think of like PTSD, particularly as it ties into a military, uh, like a, a military sort of operation, like you're in the war, like imagine like how, you know, they call it shell shock for World War II. Like, you know, we're not meant for this. We're not meant for that. That is not a human, that is not a human 
behavior set. It was, it, it became a second nature, but we can get into that later. But so you have that, you have this PTSD, this, this immensely, immensely powerful experience. And then you come back and you're like, you know, this, this connection of this immense, immense trauma, which is in the, in the body, in the nervous system, in all of these different sort of things. And then whatever was happening, which caused that, if something which is similar to that occurs again, this is why symbolism is like on every level, like, you know, a loud noise because it was a loud noise or, or a certain type of sight or a hand signal. These are called anchors. As that happens, the, the neural pathway is triggered and the behavior set is re-experienced. That is how we're wired. And that is neither a good thing or a bad thing. It is an understanding of how we are. And that is our inner world. That is the as below. There's also a positive side. I mean, of course, there's a positive side to neural pathways. Otherwise, they wouldn't have developed as an evolutionary thing for humans. But I, I have noticed what first made me aware of the connection between individual patterns of behavior and the etheric pathways or the collective consciousness's neural pathways was by observing people in flow states. And uh, specifically, I, I got into going to a lot of music festivals. And when I first started going to music festivals, I witnessed there are a few people doing flow arts, a few people that were good at hula hooping, for example. And over the years, I watched as the sea level of the average ability of a hula hooping person that was, uh, you know, into doing this as a flow art, actually the water level rose. So the more people that were doing something and becoming skilled at it, the more quickly someone that was new to it could jump in and get to a high level at it. And it like the metaphor would be these neural pathways could be like tunnels in, in the fabric of reality. And someone's been digging this tunnel out for a long time and you can jump into that tunnel and walk all the way up to where the wall is and start chipping away at the wall where they're at. Say another example would be rock climbing. Whenever that became a popular thing in the 60s or 50s or whenever that was kind of taking off, it took people literally weeks and they were camping out on the, the rock face to climb certain big walls. But now there are people that do the entire climb that took the original climbers weeks. They do it in a, in a couple of hours with no equipment, like free climbing where they could fall off. So there's, of course, if you look at sports, that's the perfect evidence for this. but uh, obviously the same goes for trauma and, and fear reactions too. So you, you're, you're 100. I, 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 first of all, I'm, I'm appreciative of you pointing out the, uh, like, you know, let's bring us back positive. You're absolutely right. I bring out the negative because like, it's easier to understand and everyone's got that. And that is, that is a, there is no getting around like, we can't separate the individual and the collective experience from the experience which is happening right now. Shit's changing. It has changing out there and it's changing in here. And in order to change is you have to understand like the deeper stuff. So, so I go there because that's just kind of naturally how I'm wired. I'm right there with you, man. <laughs> when you got your Pluto and your IC, you know, you, you just see the thing you, you can, you can appreciate that, that, Going to this level is where you can, where the, tra like, you know, I, I hate to sound cliched, but that's what transformation is. Like transformation isn't like, you know, it's, it, that's become one of those words, which, you know, if, if there was like a, your trademark new age bookstore, hallmark store, you know, transformation, but transformation is a real thing. And this is what transformation is. And I'm sorry, we're going down a tangent, but we love tangents. Well, I mean, just that word has the word trance in it. Yeah, yeah, there we go. And we'll bring this back to the flow arts and rock climbing because those were amazing examples. So transformation is this. So you can go and you think of, about the symbol of, of Scorpio and the symbol of Scorpio is the M where the third leg of the M goes beneath the bottom line and then it curves back up and points up. And so the reason I bring up Scorpio is because Scorpio is ruled by Pluto and Pluto is about transformation. It's all connected. It's all transformation. So transformation is this this. And it's magic. It's mystical. We don't understand the process. We just know that it is a process and, and it's a universal process of at some point, something decaying goes from the literal symbol of death to the literal symbol of life. At some point, that banana peel on your kitchen, on your kitchen counter, which is decomposing like and it's death. And then you throw it in your compost, 
compost pail and then it becomes the symbol of life like that that like icky gross sort of thing is what transformation is and then we and that is a universal truth and we have that inside and that part of being human is this 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 relationship of really the the what we could even think of as like you know the limbic the the emotional brain or the the emotional body to the rational mind or the neocortex or the higher mind or you know what have you like that relationship being emotional and going deep down and going really deep and then understanding like oh i do these things because of this but i've i've become who i am because of this as well like that's the transformative process and that's why I always like to bring it back to that because if you're not doing that work, you're not doing anything. You're avoiding that. And we're at a time right now in the most literal sense that this is being forced upon everyone. And force isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's not like someone with a gun to your head or maybe I hope it's not. You know, I haven't seen that. But right now is like you're at home. Like the thing we know for truth is you're at home. And there's just enough like safety net that you can't really, you know, no one's really going to slip through yet, but there's a lot of scary stuff, but you're at home in a way you've never been before. And everyone's in the same boat and you got to come face to face with all sorts of individual and collective and collective, you know, unconscious fears. And you have to do that. And that's happening as literally everything else is changing. Like it's all connected. But that being said, you're 100% right. Like this process is the joy of life. This process is the most, this is like when you describe like flow arts and rock climbing, I said, like we talked about war and that's the most unhuman thing you can imagine. Rock climbing, flow arts, that's the most human thing you can imagine. Festivals, that's the most human thing you can imagine. Like we want to be in our bodies. We want to be athletic. And we do like a bit of competition, but we got a competition in our inverse society on the wrong. It should be 2080. A lip 20% competition brings out the best in you. 80% competition, which is what our co- which is what our collective mindset is, brings out the worst. And so it's like we as we're beginning, what's what's happening, like as we are stuck inside as we are face to face with both collective and individual, like all sorts of ugly things, which we don't, which we don't like. Here's the other thing, you know, side note, they're saying it, they're literally saying, what are the most essential things to the, to your society? The person who gives you food and the person who delivers you stuff, you know, it's like, there's a truth to that. You know, it's not like the other, you know, you could go through and, and you can, you can, you can, separate, you know, the, the, the really high quality stuff, but we're beginning to understand what really matters and what doesn't matter. But even more so, we're able to see very, very clearly the dream, the dreams we've been telling ourselves, the dreams that have been fed us. And there's a very, very clear demarcation, which is being drawn in a line. And what if, if, if you can, if you're paying attention and you know what to look for and you have the right lens and appreciation of like how you work, you're going to be able to see very, very clearly what has been part of the dream within the dream within the dream, because it's all going to be connected to what you're going to be able to access. And so the flip side is what you can't access is life outside of the dream. Like they're making it very, very clear. And so we can get into unpacking that in a moment. But if you want, we could go and connect this to the etheric pathways because I haven't even gotten there yet. You tell me where you want, you want to go or if you want to comment. Yeah, yeah. The etheric pathways, I think, maybe will become evident if we start talking about some of the things that will exemplify them because it is a very esoteric idea I mean, we could talk about stuff like ley lines and actual physical energy channels of the earth and how those represent and mirror the human system, how man is the measure of the universe in a sense. But, you know, let's just leave it at that for a moment and start talking about this multi-tiered dream reality and your analysis of inception, because I think we've made it pretty clear in past episodes of the show the idea that imagination is actually the primary mode of perception, that imagination is not some a, a way of thinking, but thinking is a way of imagining, and that every other, th- every other avenue of perception that we have, every sense, every type of thought, every feeling is actually emerging out of imagination. Like imagination is what source is. If you had to 
really define it, you know, on an idealism level or the hermetic principle that all is mental. So with that in mind, we now are seeing really, especially over the last few years, just like in the movie Inception, there were these architects that could create the artificial dream landscape and keep the dreamer in a maze. We have these cul-de-sacs and circuitous paths in conspiracy research is what I'm really thinking of. But where uh, at the end of the day, you may be following breadcrumbs of truth, but a lot of people are being corralled and sent towards a, like very specific conclusions. And maybe we can t- start talking about that and how these uh, astral landscapes are actually becoming physicalized. They started out in the, the mental and psychic planes in the form of all the just plethora of new age content and ET and extraterrestrial and alien abduction literature, that much of which came out of secret society owned publishing companies and media groups. And we're seeing the, the chickens come home to roost with the time that we're in right now, where everyone's in a fractured state in terms of their worldview being consistent with the person next to them. And maybe that's actually the ultimate form of divide and conquer is, you know, whether or not the old worldview of cultures in the past, like when everybody was unified under a Puritan mentality in America, for example, whether or not we want to say that that's good or bad. And in a lot of ways, it's bad and diversity is good. Having this fractured set of worldviews from person to person is kind of part of what makes the the dream landscape that we're navigating such a maze. And I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts about this. So definitely. And I, I th- thank you for that, for that setup. So Inception, I, and I can remember watching this, like when that movie came out, I remember there's part of me that really liked it. There's part of me that wanted to like it. And there's part of me is like, what the hell did I just watch? But I watched that for whatever reason, like, I mean, it's, you know, without even getting into personal stories right now. So I watched it like a couple of weeks ago, uh, not even a couple of weeks ago, maybe like a week ago, you know, who can keep track with time anymore. And it became crystal clear, like the mo- there's a model which is, which is presented in this movie, which if you're paying attention, like, you know, if you can extract the plot, if you can extract like, you know, the, 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 what, what your, the emotional body is going to get tied into, if you're going to like pay attention to like maybe more of the, the, the rational structure of what they're telling you, they're telling you some really interesting things. Like regardless of like, however you want to go and define like Christopher Nolan in Hollywood, it's like, it is still part of the system. And even if something is inverted, you can, if you've got the right eyes, you can see truth in everything. So that being said, so what they, 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 they clearly tell you in inception, like what, what the dream world, they, they give a, a greater structure. So, the reason why we need a structure is because this idea of dream, this idea of, of this, this nebulous sort of area is of, of different realms and dimensions. It's kind of hard to kind of wrap your mind around. And this has a little bit more clarity and particularly as it relates to kind of like what the, the Gnostic teachings, regardless of what you think of the Gnostic teachings, like they talk about a certain scenario with like this, this archonic sort of like, false reality and and it's that story is also kind of told a little bit in Watiko with uh which I think is like from like the Pacific Northwest people and it like refers to this mind parasite and so there's this the within the movie Inception it describes like how that actually happens like you know you could think about that as an abstract but how would that really happen so within the plot of the movie the Inception you realize that it is the, the capability exists to create an artificial dream setting. So we first want to define what a dream is. And a dream is an experience which is in consciousness only. It's not in physical body. It's experienced just in whatever consciousness is. And when you're having a dream, you know, who knows, this is a dream too. You don't realize you're dreaming. Like, you know, that's part of what a dream is. So, and you can have them in different places. And so what they're telling us in this movie is that can be created and that is tied to physical hardware. Like there's a machine, they've got like this suitcase, right? I never tell you what's in the suitcase, but somehow the suitcase is where all the dream people go. 
And they tell you that it, it has an architecture. And the architecture isn't created by a coder. It's created by a psychology student. Someone who's very, very familiar with the workings of the mind. So they're already telling you that this is about this machine mind meld. And so slight pause right now. If you haven't seen the documentary, what's it called? It's by uh, Truth Stream Media. I think it's called like Minds of Men. They do the most phenomenal job of really explaining what the cybernetics movement was like before there was ever a computer. There was all of this like thought of creating more or less computers for one purpose only. And it's for this feedback loop from machine to control man, like exactly what we're seeing right now. So before the first computer, this is how it was laid out. So what we're seeing right now is, is exactly this. We've got this machine, which, you know, which captures the, the, uh, the setting for, for the dreamer. And what we know from the movie is that we have a set group of people who are what are known as lucid dreamers, people who can be in a dream state, but aware they're a dream and they understand all of the physics of the dream. And then you have the architect. And the architect is supposed to design a maze and it's circular. And it is circular. So if you're not really paying attention like you don't realize you're seeing the same stuff over and over again, like, you know, in the background, which was also visualized, in my opinion, very well in the movie The Matrix, though they didn't really explain the architecture of, of why it would work. They, it, was, it was kind of a different sort of telling of, the, of a similar story. So we've, we've got, this, we've got this, this artificial maze, which the dreamer is in, and he's really a mark. And you have these lucid dreamers who are trying to do something. But the way that the architecture is designed, it's just a matter of time before the dreamer realizes something's not right. And they say very clearly that the subconscious is what wakes up the dreamer. There's something deep inside the dreamer, which is like, this ain't right. You know, this is just like our subconscious, something, this isn't right. And so what they do is they build in another layer so that the dreamer thinks they wake up. But there's a second dream with the same, the same group of, of, of dreamers waiting there. We're like, okay, yeah, yeah, you caught it and you got us. And like, yeah, but it's another dream. And then it goes a dream within a dream within a dream. And different levels have like different sort of purposes. So now we want to go and look at what we know of reality, of material reality. And we can know of what we know of the ultimate machine, which is the ultimate network, whether you want to call it the internet, well, whatever, like the, the thing is, which everything is connected. That's the machine. You know, if you've done any bit of like research, you, you know, at least there are patents, you know, and I'm assuming my assumption is there's a whole, it's, it's applied. It's not just a patent, but since like the seventies and eighties that the know-how was through electromagnetic fields from a monitor to a human being that they are able to influence the, the nervous system. Like this is 30, 40 year old technology. Like this was out there. And we know the beginning of where the internet came from. We know this is the machine. We know all of this stuff. We know how Facebook and, 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 and Instagram were set up like so that you are going to be dopamine connected. Like all of this was like to get you into this parasitic relationship with, with this machine. And so we, we know there, there's that. And we know that it's very like, it's, it's the, the very setup of our machine is it's, it's self-reflecting. That's what these dreams within the dreams are. So we see that with the, with the, with the internet. And this is just one layer of the dream, but it's the most dynamic part of the dream right now, the most powerful, like everything's been leading to this. And, you know, in my opinion, and in, in what they're saying is 5G. But that is the, the hardware. The other part of Inception has to do with getting the dreamer in the right state through a cocktail of pharmaceuticals so that they're stable enough to have these dreams, but not quite too stable that they're, you know, that something bad happens to them in, in the movie. And so we also know that all of humanity has been in a slew of, of different of pharmaceutical cocktail, whether that's like actually taking prescription or just like breathing the air with everything that's in the air and sprayed in the air, or put in the water, or like, you know, not to mention like all of the, the, the other electromagnetic smog. So it's like that really is in, that really is in play. And we're seeing that happening right now. And so, 
it's, it's very evident. Like once you kind of know, like know what to look for and you're, you're looking at what is being projected from this TV and like all of this stuff, like the, the, the clues, if you will, that have been built into the, the telling of this story that we're all experiencing, like, you know, they're like, it's, it's, it's quite evident. This is, this is a game that's in play and it's a dream. And the thing, which is very interesting, and this is what's hard for people. And this is how you know you're like still waking up into another layer of the dream is that you don't want to give it up. You don't want to give it up. And that's part of this, like what, what I'm calling a hundred year plan, which began with the first computer. But, and what it, what's happened really is if you've been born since 1945, you have been slowly, like culture has been slowly kind of like indoctrinated to this, what's happening right now, which is this really tightening of, of this, what, what I would call like this artificial kind of dream reality, which humanity has been in for however long, I don't know. And it's shifting gears. Right now there's a shift which is happening and there is a very, very hard pull to get people to commit, and this is the this is the key word because this is this is being orchestrated at a very very high spiritual level, and on a high spiritual level means it must be it it can't you can't force someone to do something against their will without incurring karma, without incurring feedback, and so there are ways there are loopholes. Our entire this entire world is built upon loopholes. And what loopholes are, are ways to avoid karma. And so once you realize that's like part of the structure of the dream reality is like everything's a loophole. So what, what, what's happening is there is this, you know, there's been this psychological thing which has been put on everyone and everyone has been born since 1945 to a certain degree has been hooked. No different than a crack baby. Like, you know, if you are literally like if you were born and there's crack in your system. Like that's your, you're born with that. And we know about like the, the biological and the neurological occurrences that happen to, to, to someone who's born that way, but we're all, and how it, it changes the experience of, of the individual, you know, without getting into like free will and stuff like that, it just does, does. And all of us, depending upon what was part of the culture, particularly the popular culture and the technology at the time of your most fundamental development of, of personality, your zero to seven, you know, that's what you're kind of hooked on to. And so what's happening is everyone is, is the, the, after the, you, nothing's actually occurring other than a great deal of social pressure and, and threats like the wizard of Oz to go down a certain path. And now that's like, you want it back. It's going to change because now is a time of change. And this is what age of Aquarius is all about. That's why this is timed with all of those planets moving into Aquarius, because this is one expression an inversion of a general expression of the age of Aquarius. And we can talk about like, even if there is an age of Aquarius, there's a greater reality than that. But within like saying, okay, there's an age of Aquarius, there are multiple expressions of it. And what we're seeing, what we're seeing is this dream reality to pull people into this certain expression, which is very, very anti-human. It is, it is not homo sapien, it is robo sapien. So what we're seeing right now is this reduction of all of the qualities that are human and it's being replaced for a robot. And if it is your free will to go in, like, you're like, this is friggin' awesome. I love this. Like, you, at least you're doing that willfully and with, with knowledge. But there's also an underhanded, occulted, esoteric, you know, subconscious hypnosis, dream sort of thing, which has forced people into this situation. And now they're like, I, I, I want to go back to work. I want, I want my phone. I want my internet. And and it's becoming very, very like, you know, if you, you're you willing to go and say, if this is what I need to do in order to go and have my stuff back, I'm going to go and do it. And this is the baseline. Like, this is the baseline. Like, this is where it gets exciting. But I wanted to pause to first talk, uh, like, to clarify the, the baseline. Because once we understand the baseline, then we can get into, like, what you were talking about, which is the more exciting stuff. But we have to be 
we have to be clear with understanding the the kind of like the 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 darker underhanded stuff which is at least being sold on a very very large scale man yeah definitely a lot of places we can go with this but i'm sure that you've got an idea so i'll just throw out a couple of things that i find really relevant about you know this lane we're in right here first of all the word dream is an anagram for derma which means skin the external surface so in a way, the external reality being dreamlike, there's, there's a, many ways to actually symbolically ascertain that. I mean, just the very fact that, as you say, the deeper you go, the more symbolic things are. I mean, I've experienced that in whatever, in whatever field or realm I'm going deep into, things become more and more symbolic. But I want to talk about controlled awakenings too, just to, just to mention that concept of how the operatives would pull them or like make them believe they'd woke up from the dream, but then they're actually just waiting there to entrap them in the next level up. I think we see this happen repeatedly, especially in the last several decades, but you can go all the way back to the Protestant reformation. That was a controlled awakening. You can look at the QAnon phenomenon where people think that they're catching on to like what's really going on, but they're actually just being rounded up into a specific worldview beyond that. And I think, uh, to to talk about inception a little more, the goal of the operatives is to create the conditions for the target to arrive in an idea organically, with the purpose being to pull some specific information out of their unconscious mind. But do you think that the inception that's being done on the larger culture is targeting the power of their imaginations? By that, I mean, if the conditions are set for masses of humanity to believe certain cornerstone ideas about the world they live in, or as you were saying, go from being against their lifestyle, you know, hating their job, feeling like a slave to saying, Oh, I want it all back. I miss it. And and then they think that that's their own idea. Then the manifestation power of all those minds is now adjusted to create a specific cultural or even reality level outcome. And I think the coronavirus narrative is a perfect example of that, just like you're insinuating. So, so, I mean, you brought it up before, like with the talking about like the, the rising of the water when like more people started the, I guess you'd call it even a hundred monkey effect, all that sort of thing. Like the, there's a certain power when, when everyone is on a, on the same sort of mindset and we're seeing that, that technique, which has always kind of worked. And, and that's like the inception, like it's like this dream within the dream and, and that sort of stuff. And, and we can see that now, but if you're like, if you've come to the point where you can see that and, and, you don't want to chase your own tail. You don't want to end up being like chasing your own tail. So the question is like, well, how do I not, how do I, how do I, this is what I mean by navigate. How do I work my way through this? It's like, you know, how do I know what is a belief? And a belief is something like, which I don't have actual proof. And you could, some things you got to believe. And maybe you choose, you don't want to believe anything, but at least you know where you are. But, but the navigation, it's like, how do we recognize? And, and, and I think that's very important. And we can, ground that into a really objective skill set, if you will, or maybe like at least a perspective. I'm not saying like this is the only perspective, but I think this is very, very helpful in terms of the navigation. So first you recognize that that there's a there's a blind spot, that we all have a blind spot that, you know, we've been born more or less crack babies, you know, just by being in this time. And and this is also, you know, I, I, I joke about the darker stuff, but it's like, this is all like, this is the transformation, like the very process of what I'm talking about. Like, if you actually, you know, you step back, what I'm suggesting is like, this is how you go and you appreciate everything. Like almost like realize that the inversion world, everything in the inversion world is, can, you can reverse the, the inversion. You can just like reverse engineer and you'll know what the opposite, I, the higher truth, if you will, or at least the human truth. So this is how you go and you navigate it is, well, first is we, we have some sort of understanding of what it is to be human. And, and I, and we'll, we'll couch that, but there are certain qualities that we can begin to define of what is human nature. And then we also have to recognize what is then what's called second nature, you know, what you've learned and you, you just do second nature is a neural pathway. You've learned it and you just do it unconsciously, but it's not true nature. So, so that's an important thing to recognize. But before we go down there, we want to go and, and whatever the thing is, which is in question 
it, particularly if it's something which has been created, you know, which is which is not like naturally occurring, is you bring it back to its origins and you look at its foundational fruits. Who invented it? Well, how does it happen? Like in very, very lot, in very, very material ways. I mean, we're talking like spiritual, we're talking mental, but it's still very, very physical. I mean, I want to go back to, I, I want to say this one thing, the derma thing, skin, like that is literally it, like skin and like particularly the, the fascia, you know, the deep, deep stuff, like that's a physical thing, but that physical working on that level of, of like body work, like for all of us, that's how we physically connect. Like there's, when you get into some of like the deeper craniosacral sort of stuff, they're like, this is where we actually connect with the macrocosm and the fascia. So it's like all of that body work. It's a physical thing. It's a mental thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's all the same thing. So you go back and you look at something's original nature, where it began in our reality. And then you ask yourself, is this in harmony with what we are calling human nature? Or is this in harmony with something which isn't human? And for me, that's destruction out of harmony, death, all of these sort of things. I'm not saying death is not part of life. I'm saying like being purposefully destructful, parasitic. That is not a human way. And so when we go back and you look at anything in, in, in our material world, and I like to use computers a lot, everything about the computer industry, every piece of physical hardware, I don't care. Like you and I, we, we, we have computers right now and we're able to do this. And that's a good thing. You know, or I'm enjoying that and it's beneficial and there's good. Hopefully that's going to come out of that. But that being said, we are using we're still building this on a foundation of, of, of decay. Computers require something which is out of harmony with the physical environment to extract the rare metals. There's slave labor involved with it. There's like so many things about computers and it, like on a very, very like logical, physical thing. It's like, it's out of harmony. This is a military industrial complex industry. It's like, that is, that is the truth. That is not harmonious. At some point, I don't think we're there yet. And I, I keep saying this to myself. It's like, you know, I want to be physically done. This is part of waking up from the dream. You have to at least begin with the idea that everything which is physical hardware is part of the inverse dream. And if you can't come to that, you are still in the dream. And I want to finish why and, and, and finish this because most people get caught up in that because they're like, I don't want to live like the stone ages. I'm not looking to go back to some hippie commune. And I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm suggesting if that's what you think of as your, your option, and maybe that's a good, a good thing, like where you don't have electricity and you don't have any travel and you don't have cars and you don't have that. I'm like, I kind of like the trappings of modern society. I think there's some truth to like the, the, you know, the ability to talk to someone on the other side of earth, the ability to travel to one side of the earth to another. I think that's important and I want to do that. But if your imagination has been so captured by the dream that you cannot imagine that there has to be another expression that maybe you've never seen before, but which is in alignment to the higher truth. This is how you navigate it. You'd be like computers are ultimately fundamentally harmful and part of the dream, but they do point to truth. The truth is I want to have a way which I can connect to all my friends. I want to be able to access information like in a real tangible way, which I can go and scroll through, but I want to be able to do it in a way which is, which is, you know, in harmony with the environment. This is like, that's where it's going to. And the situation which we're in is going to force people one way or the other that you're going to commit that you're going to live into someone else's imagination or you begin to become open in a very, very real way. And, and we can get into the trivium and the quadrivium. I don't, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with them. I mean, that's been, that came into the, the alternative world's consciousness probably a little bit before 2012. I'd never heard of it before then, but that's when it started becoming interesting. And that is a big key. But everyone has always expressed the trivium aspect, which is the logical mind, the logical mind, the logical mind, seeing through fallacies. And there's a real important part of that. 
And if you go back and really understand what the trivium and quadrivium are about, it's that you first learn the trivium. And until you have mastered rational mind, and the rational mind is what you use to be able to say like, "Uh uh-oh, fool me once, you know, shame on you, fool me twice, I don't get fooled again, you know what? (laughs) That's the rational mind, that's the trivium. Once you've mastered that, then you can step into the quadrivium, which is the imagination which is the ability to really let the mind go. Because if you do it the other way around, you're a fool and you can go and get, take, you can t- get taken advantage by, by, by sharper minds than you, which is why the, the, way, the, the human way of teaching the process of the mind is you first learn the rational. And once you have that foundation, you allow the imagination to like, Go upon that. And this is almost kind of like your own internal scientific method. But this is what is in front of us or the potentiality. This is why I go back and saying, like, there's something greater, which, you know, using the rational mind, you know, a rational mind, it's possible that they're telling me bullshit with like the Soho satellites, but let me assume it's true. And let me just take it's true just on the imagination. Something strange is going on, like, on a greater level. And we don't have to be caught up in this dream. You can, you can understand what's happening by watching the dream. And then you can begin to say like, as you begin to really do the physical work of what it means to like wake up, which is like, you know, going in and really like understanding, know thyself and then like getting back into the body and like really developing practices. This is part of like what being a human and in a human body is like, and it's meant to be fun, flow arts, rock climbing, tree climbing, stretching, yoga. Like you want to feel dancing. I mean, there's nothing better than dancing. Movement in time with, with, with rhythm. I mean, it's, 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 you know, the, the acts and you begin to remember what it is to be human because that's what this is about. And, and so, All of this, we talked about the neural pathways and I talked a lot about the microcosm, the human experience, the individual experience, but somehow in this magic world of experience, which somehow, I don't know what it is, but there is a connection between our inner world and the outer world from the smaller and the greater from what we're in. And in the same way that there are these neural pathways, there are these, what I'm calling an etheric pathway. And What we know from as above, so below is if you can understand the as below, you know, because it's easier to study, you can make assumptions, you can apply those general truths on a different scale. And so that's a skill set. So if you understand there's a neural pathway and how neural pathways work with symbolism and anchoring and with emotionality, you don't really see them. Well, the same thing is, is true on a greater level. And that's what I'm calling etheric pathways. And that too is anchored in on the physical level. And whatever earth may be, you know, we know that it's got these, these, these rivers. We know rivers have always had like a really significant role within humanity. And we know within the physical body, we've got things that are kind of like rivers. We've got like veins and we've got arteries. We, you know, we've got mechanisms of, of bringing fluid in a certain way and, and you also know, like, you know, rivers are, are, have been tied into the magical dream world, like money. Money is another thing. Like money is a friggin' dream. Like money's real in the fact that it is a, a convenient means of exchange. But that's about it. When it became parasitic and, and like the ultimate dream, and if we, we can talk about this later, this is where it gets real fun, is a real human experience is that we are able to be completely self-regulated by mind alone. Um, And that's not abstract, that being real. But the etheric pathways, the the rivers, and so we can see rivers like could correspond within the physical body. And within the physical body, you know, you could go and look at like your circulatory system, your, your veins and your arteries. And there's certain arteries and veins which are older. They're more central. They formed first. They've been around longer, evolutionary, however you want to call it. But the older the ones or the the placement, the more significant they are. And so there's a certain river on this planet which no one's ever heard of. You know, there's the most important stuff you don't know of. It's all occulted. And it's basically the oldest river on the planet. And there we find the very first, the very first expressions of the computer industry, the very first expressions of globalism, 
the very first expressions of wire distribution of electricity. And all three of these are expressions of age of Aquarius archetypes. And what has been done is on the etheric level, they've been put on the river, whatever river is, what it corresponds with in this reality, whatever it is, this is what happened. Like go and look in your history books, go and look in your geology books, and you will see that this, this, this river is anchored in with an incredibly anti-human parasitic model of how this age of, of Aquarius is going to be expressed. And then once you recognize like this is what's been going on, then you can begin to then remember, wake up, explore, experiment, whatever you want, you know, call it because that's part of the human experience is meant to be joyful. This is where we find ourselves and we, and we are in this very unique placement, which is both very, very tangible and at the same time, very abstract, very spiritual, which we are experiencing at this exact moment. Can I offer some, some places where like, where people can find some more stuff? Oh yeah, please, man. And that was going to be my final question before we wrapped up. Thanks for being here, man. This has been an incredible conversation and really got, I mean, leading up to it and during it, uh, just in interfacing with your work has really got me putting together dots that I've never put together before, uh, remembering epiphanies that I've had in the past that just kind of melted away after the epiphany and just all around really good stuff. I, I'd actually hope to be able to talk to you again because we didn't even discuss the largest body of your work other than tangentially, which is the Susquehanna alchemy mystery, but people should definitely listen up and take note of where they can go to find that and more because you've done lots of work putting things on the internet and a lot of stuff is available. So yeah, where can they find you? So as it relates to the Susquehanna mystery, so if, if you like the details, if you got plenty of time on your hand, cause you got nothing else to do, <laughs> I've got a lot of details. You could go and see that probably the best place is there's some videos on YouTube, Susquehanna alchemy. And I go into like why this, this phenomenal correlation of events that have happened onto this river, but they're ultimately all about like pointing out, like from all these different perspectives that there's something really significant happening on this river. And if you happen to live in the mid Atlantic, like, you know, New York down to DC, it's, it's pretty close. Assuming you could get out of the house at some point, you can go and, and, and experience it. Chesapeake Bay. If you're familiar with the Chesapeake Bay, that's Susquehanna river as well. Like it's the same body of water. Just one part's called the Chesapeake Bay. Another way is like on my website, I, I, I'm an artist. I make a lot of stuff. I write, so I made this rights of the 40th parallel. I'll send you a copy if you give me your address afterwards. And it's a way which people who cannot get there physically can have like an imaginatory, but like real experience. I've gone like in the four parts of like the, the, the part of the research keeps going back to this area, the 40th parallel at the Susquehanna river and why it's so significant and how it has like some sort of like real, you know, mysticism for lack of a better word. And so this is a way you can experience it. Not so much like, you know, these are all the facts as much as like, this is what it looks like. This is a map of the area. This is what, where you, if you were there physically, this is what you would go to. This is what it symbolizes and so forth. So you can find those on my website, those books, if you are interested in connecting that way. In my opinion, a big thing which needs to happen from waking up from the dream is this reconnection in a very, very real way between the human being, the human experience, and the, and the physical environment, which was my motivation for, for making this book. And then there's also, I do a lot of like stone work where I take art and, or take, as I said before, like I, I collect stones and then I really make exquisite pieces out of them. And, and my primary technique is I coat them with sand and I make coatings with it and I paint them and I make them really, really cool. So, you know, I don't know if this, if this is a video for people, but here's an example of one I'm working on right now. And what I like to think of them as is like, this is a big piece of Labradorite. Labradorite, it's a stone that when polished, it has all of these these colors that at first you don't see, but when you wiggle it around, you can see these colors. So it's said to be a, a stone which 
which one keeps nearby in order to see things which are normally hidden. You know, it's good with, with, you know, maybe psychic ability and that sort of stuff. And I have tons of it in my bedroom around my bed and the windows in that room. Really cool. The Labradite piece. And I also wanted to say, I love the astrological starboards that you make as well in a kind of a similar technique, really, really unique things. The starboard is is where I do the astrology sessions. And, you know, I've been really like slowing back, as I said lately, like I've been reducing the number of, of starboard sessions I, I, I'm doing, which means like the, the turnaround time is longer. But what I basically do with the starboard session is I tell someone's story through through the placement of the planets when they took their first breath outside of their mother's womb. And Regardless of what I say is accurate or not, what I do is I create a very, very strong connection between the conscious mind and the the known macrocosm, the placement of the planets. And turns out like what I say seems to, you know, based upon feedback, really, really helps people see parts of themselves in a greater way, in a more clear way, in a very, very like safe way to go into like blind spots. And so you can order those on my website. I do that for like relationships and I do that like individuals. I could do really in-depth ones, which are called Starboard Plus, where I get deep into someone, you fill in like an in-depth questionnaire about your life experiences. And I show how like they correlate. Instagram, I uh, used to, you know, as I'm saying, like I'm hemming and hawing because I'm like, there's part of me that really likes putting this information out, but there's also this part of me, which is like, I got to slow down. Like I'm really reducing the amount of like this, this computer uh, interaction, which I'm having. So I'm in the process of figuring that out right now. So I don't know how, how much I'm going to be releasing more information, but where it would be, would be the Instagram account, uh, which is Susquehanna Alchemy as well. Or if you want to get like, like more of the user, the private sort of stuff, that's at subscribestar.com at Susquehanna Alchemy. That's where you can go and get that sort of more proprietary sort of thing. So those are the places where people can go and find me. I love comments on any of the stuff which is out there. So you know, that's cool too. <laughs> Very good. Definitely follow Michael on Instagram. Even if you don't post a lot of new stuff going forward, there's still some really cool, quick little, they're like, they're like bigger memes, you know, this is, it's images and words put together, but not simple. And the really cool synchronistic pathways that you can follow. And if you want the, the more in-depth version of those things, check out the YouTube, of course, you've got some great videos on YouTube about, I mean, we talked about the inception thing a lot, but that video has plenty more to say on the subject that we never even touched. And that's just one thing. I mean, you've also got a lot of good content on the current coronavirus pandemic as well. So yeah, I just hope people realize that we've barely even scratched the surface of the Michael Waniverse. And <laughs> it's been my pleasure having you here, man. Thanks so much and take care. All right. Thank you for having me. Well, all right, guys. I think we nailed it on that one. <laughs> it was a little longer than average, which I'm pretty happy about because... I could have kept going with Michael for another hour before getting tired for sure, even though we did that conversation at night and it got increasingly closer to my bedtime. I felt more and more fired up the farther we went. It's definitely fun to connect with a kindred spirit and feel that harmonic resonance that comes in when two people are getting in sync and sharing what they think. Ideas come out of both of us that maybe we've never even put into words before. So. Thanks, Michael, for being that guy for me this time around and reminding me once again why I like to do what I do and have these type of chats. It was a lot of fun. Can't wait to have Michael back for, I don't know what we'll talk about. Could be anything. <laughs> I definitely only touched about half of my notes on that one. And if more time passes and I look at more of his work, I'm going to just have more notes and more questions. So looking forward to when we can make that happen. And Man, there's a lot of stuff to talk about as far as my thoughts regarding the topics we did cover this time around. First of all, this the main thing I really wanted to talk about at all was the etheric patterns and neural pathways, which we really did go in depth on that stuff. And I was happy about it. And hopefully you've seen some of the other research out there over the last many years that is supporting this type of a theory. One guy to look at is Rupert Sheldrake. 
Rupert Sheldrake has lots of books on it. I think he got brought up in the conversation with Laurel Erica, Laurel Erica. I always want to say Erica, Laurel Erica last week. And he has this concept of morphogenetic fields, which is sort of like a fancy way of talking about the 100th monkey effect. Maybe you've heard of the 100th monkey effect. Maybe not. Google that. That's a good uh, concept to have in mind. But one of the experience, experiments I remember hearing about quite a while back was this idea of having rats run a maze and then having like other rats of the same species. Maybe they're like related. They're from the same family of rats. I'm not exactly sure how it was set up, but they have one group practice a maze until they get really fast at it and improve their time by a significant amount by doing it over and over again. And then they have rats on the other side of the world that have never seen the maze before run it for the first time. And they have times that are close to what the original group of rats had after practicing it a bunch. There's a lot of examples like this where kind of like I was talking about with people learning to hula hoop and the more people that learn how to do something, the easier it is for all of us to jump into that, that vein or that, uh, that tunnel, that neural pathway tunnel and get right to the edge of it and push forward. I think it's good news to realize this because it means all the stuff that you think that you're not good at because you've never really tried and that you could never be as good as someone else who's good at it. Actually, the the fact is you could jump in there and it might be something you zoom through. And I mean, not to get discouraged if things do take time to improve whenever you're working on something skill based. But the fact is, if someone else can do something, you can probably do it unless there's a type of like physical or mental handicap in the way or you know, something like that. And even still, there's probably a way around it. So that's a great idea to keep in mind for sure that we've got a lot more ability and a lot more connection to other people's ability than we realize. So yeah, practice stuff and see what you can do. I'd love to hear what you guys think of of this idea if you've seen it in action somewhere else. And then another cool concept that got brought up was the trivium and the quadrivium. I would definitely check those out. The trivium is kind of like a, a logic thing. It's involving like input processing output, to put it simply. And it's an old way of teaching how to process information, how to learn that doesn't really get taught anymore. But the quadrivium is something that goes along with it. Once you understand the trivium method of being able to analyze information, the quadrivium is uh the four classical arts that kind of tie together and demonstrate the width and breadth of our physical reality. So you've got mathematics is the first one, and that's like the baseline. Everything is number. Then you have music, which is a timing thing. Music teaches you about occurrences across a, a time stretch, right? And geometry is the third one, and that's all about space. So if you understand space from geometry and understand time, you've got space time right there and you combine number with that. Of course, numbers involved in both of them. It's the foundation. And the fourth thing would be astronomy, because when you look at bodies in the sky, not only are they moving in space, but they're moving in time. So they have a cyclical rhythm to them the way music does. So if you have all four of those types of uh, <laughs> studies, well studied not mastered because there's no mastering it. But if you understand those four things, it could be the keys to everything else. Everything else kind of can relate to back to the, the quadrivium. I heard that Pythagoras, the ancient Greek philosopher, uh, mystery school teacher, wouldn't even speak to somebody unless they'd mastered the quadrivium. So what do they, what do they teach us as a school now? Definitely not the quadrivium. I mean, Maybe a little bit of it here and there, but music definitely isn't promoted as something everybody should have something to do with. But back to the idea of the etheric pathways, I really like Michael's work on the Susquehanna River. You got to check that out. Susquehanna, never know if I'm saying that right. And this idea that rivers correlate to our larger earth ley lines and also to our body's veins and nervous system. So if the occult history of rituals involving rivers and river goddesses, such as those that you can learn about in Michael's work on the Susquehanna, if, if those things are real, if there is an influence that can be 
placed upon the earth and upon humanity by doing certain types of ritual magic involving rivers, it also seems kind of likely to me to be able to influence the universe and <laughs> at large by what's going on with vaccine injections. Because the vaccines get injected straight into your veins, and that's like polluting the river of that individual person. And as a microcosmic ritual done in mass, it seems like very likely to influence the macrocosm, maybe on an etheric level, not just on the physical level of people having problems from being vaccinated. So I guess before I continue talking about other stuff that I'm interested in from this chat, let's talk about what was in the plus extension. You can find the plus extension at interverse plus forward slash interverse, just like every week. If you haven't heard me ask yet to sign up, here I am asking you to sign up. Think about it. You like this show. You're already listening to it week to week, getting the three hour. Why wouldn't you want to double that? And you just got your $1,200 from Master Trump or whatever. So toss five bucks my way. Even if you only sign up for a month. You could get a lot of podcast listening in in that month. You can go pick out the ones that you're most interested in hearing the second hour on and enjoy them. And I don't get any other kind of financial support for the work I'm doing here. I refuse to do advertising. I think it's lame and don't want to hold your attention hostage just to make a few bucks. I want the attention that you spend on this podcast to be 100% grade A high quality attention. <laughs> Not trying to waste your time. So that's all I'll say about Plus, other than I'll tell you about how to or what, you know, what to expect if you do sign up and get into this Plus episode. We discussed questioning the nature of artificial intelligence, the AI that's invading our physical and psychic space, the frequency war, hypnotic technology, 5G, and numerological connections between different aspects of this frequency war. We talked about recognizing the power of the imagination to create either disease or health based on our belief and applying that knowledge to how we look at stuff like 5G. The fractal nature of the breath. I love that. I, I came to some realizations about breath after this conversation. And it's weird because I think about breath a lot, think about breathing a lot, but you can always wake up a little more from this dream. And we talked about waking up from the dream that we don't have control of our bodies and becoming self regulated which is actually the kind of grounds of a lot of occult teachings, how to become self-regulated. Wim Hof, for example, who's so self-regulated, you can inject poison into his veins and he doesn't get sick. That type of stuff is what the real deep occult teachings are trying to help people awaken to. Complete and total self-regulation. And if you look at man as the microcosm of the universe and what man thinks that his life is like is that you have this automatic nervous system and all these automatic bodily processes and they have we have no control over these things. Doesn't that kind of reflect a universe where the God or the ultimate creator or whatever the organism is that the universe is its body? It doesn't have any control over the universe itself. If we don't have the ability to self-regulate our bodies, then maybe that means God doesn't have the ability to self-regulate. The cosmos. Think about it. I don't know. It's just a thought. <laughs> could be, though. It could be. I like this idea. If we can get self regulated, maybe we'll bring the spirit of the creator or the intelligence of creation itself more dramatically into focus and wake up from the dream of separation for real and start building like we are infinite creators, like we've got eternity, like we've got free energy because we do we totally do back to the plus extension though we talked about tataria i don't know if you've heard about tartaria go google that phrase that's a huge rabbit hole the mud flood which is part of that idea and generally speaking both of those topics relate to the high probability that our historical record is mostly fictional and only a few hundred years of history have any truth to them or relevance I could buy that. I mean, think about it. If there was a grand precursor civilization from not long ago and the archaeology and the ruins around the world definitely support the idea. It seems to me more likely, actually, that humans had high culture in the recent past and for maybe most of our existence rather than the idea that we've been struggling through hundreds of years of dark ages. 
look how quickly we've advanced nowadays without a whole lot of things holding us back. Well, actually, there are a lot of things holding us back. There's a million tyrants holding us back. How, how many of us know our ancestry very far into the past? And how complete or true is that information anyway? Is it provable? For me, for my worldview, I think it's healthier, more conducive to what I want to move into in the future to imagine that humanity has more innate integrity than what we see today and that we've been holding ourselves back due to some very clever mind control that we do on ourselves and we program into our external dream reality to do on us so that we can take our personal responsibility and pretend it doesn't exist. But yeah, we could have started a few generations ago as all children with the adults totally wiped out by some other force, some evil force that then just took and programmed the new history into the children. And how would they know, especially if they didn't have any technology yet, they didn't have reading and writing. Who knows when that might've happened, but all of those ideas are packed into the research on Tartaria and the mud flood. So check that out. If you think that's interesting, plus extension, we also talked about divination, the I Ching and tarot and inventing your own system for tapping into the imagination to gain information. Pretty self-explanatory, but very useful information, deep stuff. And we talked about becoming the king, <laughs> literally the, becoming the king of your own reality and the king of truth, hide and seek, which we're playing with the creative intelligence of the universe or God, whatever you want to call it, the all. But that's all that was in plus. If you think that sounds neato, then you should get on Patreon and go sign up because it doesn't cost you much. and. It's a win-win for both of us. Also, don't forget to go find Michael's YouTube channel. Michael Wan's YouTube channel is Susquehanna Alchemy. His website is the same name. You can dig into his work for a long time if you're interested in synchro mysticism. He's one of my favorites out there that talks about it. He has some really wild content from earlier in the year where he shows all the numerological and symbolic evidence that Kobe Bryant was a type of sacrifice ritual. That's pretty cool stuff. I mean, not cool if you like Kobe Bryant or you're upset that he died, which I guess, I mean, I am. I'm not a basketball fan, but I don't want anybody to die with their daughter in a helicopter crash if that's really what happened. But still, wouldn't it be even worse if there was some kind of ritual element going on and it was part of a mind control program that, or a distraction program at the very least? And I don't know. Go look at what Kobe was up to. He was writing esoteric like fiction novels, really weird stuff. Michael's got great content on that. He also did an episode of the Higher Side Chats, one of my favorite shows, which is also where I even found out about him. And he talked about the Kobe Bryant thing extensively there. But that's about all I have to say in this outro. I feel like I said a lot and said it fast. Maybe I'm a little too caffeinated, but I've got lots of fun things coming up for you. So stay tuned. Really excited about next week's episode. And I'm going to play us out with the good old homie Cadella. I love playing Cadella songs. He's got a new one out called Mindful Get Down. You can find that on SoundCloud. Just search for Cadella, K A D E L A, or find the link for that in the show notes as well. And I'm going to try to get a copy of Michael's book, Rights of the 48th Parallel, and have him on again sooner than later. But that's about it for me, guys. I love you all very much. You're Great friends of mine, even the ones that I've never talked to. It's awesome that we get to connect this way across space and time and have these type of conversations. Hope they're good as, as good for you as they are for me. And that's about it. I'm out of here. Talk to you guys soon. Be good out there. And uh, <laughs> watch out for those Inception secret agents uh, building dreams around you to extract information and hijack your imagination. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. I know some time now for you to take a break. At this moment in time, let any sounds gently fade.
Fit that booty in there. Ooh. 